And welcome again to anyone who's tuning in now. If this is your first time at First uh, Church, we want to welcome you. Uh, if you need more information, contact us in the chat. Uh, currently, uh, just announcements, we have a Tuesday night class, a Science of Mind class, and that's at 7. And we have a Holmes and Hay self-esteem building class on every Thursday. I'm sure most of you know that, but I'm saying that for anyone who's new. Uh, today's talk uh, came about from me studying some of Raymond Charles Barker's work. And he's, uh, he's becoming my favorite of all of them. Uh, this talk is uh, entitled, How to Solve Your Problems. And you don't usually hear me talking about problems. I've been trained to think of my problems as my exciting opportunities. Uh, but I took a look at Barker's presentation years ago. And uh, of course, I tried to condense it and modernize it and simplify it. I, I may even do more so as we go because it's uh, it, it must have been a, uh, quite, it could have been a seminar. So you'll be hearing his words mixed in with mine, so if you're looking for the reference, uh, that's the name of the talk. Uh, we believe in the power and the presence that's in each of us, in everything and everywhere. We believe in the spirit of life, again, that's in all of us, the energy of life. We believe that that living spirit is always here, it's always now, it's always present. <laughs> uh, it's been told to me years ago, it's a presence. It's never an absence. And that takes a lot. You, really, you know, I don't know, probably as I was leaving my, uh, I'll say my roots. I, mean, I grew up as a Catholic kid, and I thought God was above and kind of scary. And <laughs> I was taught that God was love, but still God was kind of scary. And as a kid, because you're getting all this training where you, God is love, but God also you know, can really do a number on you kind of thing. So it was kind of a message that, I don't know, I could never quite reconcile, but we believe in a God here that is a presence, and it's a power, and it's here, and it's now, and it's in you, and it's never outside of you. And it's all tied up with this word consciousness, which we attempt to explain to you every week in some way or another. And it's the action of consciousness, okay? The action of consciousness means it's within me and it responds to me somehow. It, and, you know, the, we're talking about life itself. Sometimes we say it's mind, which is a strange word to people. But it's this thing which Ernest Holmes describes. It's the heart of life. It's the love of life. It's the beauty of life. It's perfect action. It's the whole bit, as Barker would have said. We believe this, we know it to be true, and we're going to remind our subconscious mind today that this is true, that power is within us, and we can learn how to use it through affirmative prayer, uh, thinking, and treatment. And there's a process of treatment that I've decided. When I'm done with the Tuesday night class, which will be in another couple weeks, I'm going to do a at least a couple of classes on affirmative prayer. Uh, I don't think we've ever really done it, really done it. We've talked about it. Have we done it recently? No. So we're going to really do it. <laughs> uh, we'll probably have a break, and then we, we will do that um, probably some Tuesday down the road. So today, know with me that there is one energy, one source, one higher power. And think of it always as one, never divided. So if you grew up in one of those traditional faiths where you got some power for our darkness or evil and all that, we're going to step away from all that. And we're going to know that there's one energy that fills everything in the galaxies and the stars and the planets and fills you and fills me. And then it responds to us and it animates life everywhere. It fills us with inspiration if we let it, right? It floods us with new ideas. We have health. We have peace. And there is divine action or creative activity. You can language it in a lot of ways. Uh, so if you don't like the word divine or you have a problem with the idea of God, some people will do, think of it as an energy, a perfect flowing energy that animates all of life. It is an action and it's in action in all of us. Uh, once again, it's a presence and never an absence. 
It's healing, it's blessing, it's prosperous, it's making us great people. That creative, empower, that creative power intended us to, um, how do you say, uh, it always intended us to be more of what we are. By that I mean to express more of what we expressed before. You know, we're always on a continuum of growth. We don't think of ourselves that way because sometimes we wake up and we see our lives, oh my God, what has happened and I've lost this and I've lost that. But nothing is truly lost in all of us if you think of ourselves as being in a process of unfolding, of, of being in school, if you will. We're all learning and every one of us, myself included, are more than what we were six months ago or six years ago. We're wiser than we used to be. We know more. We are all doing things differently. We're growing, we're evolving. And this is the way life is. And it's not just happening in us, it's happening in everyone in the world. So we have this perfect unfolding life. And if we can realize that, we're gonna, then we will have perfect joy. We'll have great peace. We'll have everything. So all right, everything's good and so it is. So that's my uh, little opening after Celia's opening, which was wonderful. And we're talking again on the subject this morning of problems have answers, okay? Or problems have solutions. If you've ever heard of that before, this will be a moder modern day version of uh, that great uh, expression. We in New Thought, and there are a lot of us in New Thought today, see, some of us think, well, New Thought's just science of mind. It's religious science. Um, some of you will think, well, that has to do with INTA, which is the International New Thought Movement, or it has to do with CSL, or it has to do with uh, Anton, which is the affiliated New Thought. Um, there's a lot of groups out there that are teaching New Thought. You know, even now, I've tuned in a few times, Oprah's got her super soul Sunday. She's teaching New Thought. New Thought's been taught on television and programs by Wayne Dyer, by Deepak Chopra, uh, by Marion Williams. It's taught, it's been taught in a lot of places and people don't understand it when they're watching some of these people that, you know, they think it's all about the teacher and really what it is, it's about the teaching. And that's one of the things we've always realized here at First Church from its very inception. Raymond Charles Barker was all about the teaching. And he was the founder of this particular um, uh, church, now called Center. Uh, Frederick Bales, who's our author of uh, the Tuesday night class, he's one of the principal authors, he was all about the teaching too, and he was great friends with Ernest Holmes. And you know, Ernest Holmes was always conflicted, like he wanted people to have the authentic experience of this God within. That was the thing, that was the teaching. And he was conflicted about church building because what we know of churches, of any church, not just ours, but any, when they get too organized and too, too um, uh, I don't know, sophisticated and governing, sometimes they get away from uh, the actual teaching of itself. And you can look to any faith, you can look to the Christian faith, which was the one I grew up in, uh, there was this guy, Jesus, who had a message, and the message was beautiful and it was pure. Uh, through the centuries, it, the governance around the message, through the fourth and fifth century in particular, uh, somewhat altered uh, his simple message, which is, uh, you know, that God that you're looking for is within. You know, the, the Father is within, the Spirit is within. Uh, these things that I do, you can do too. That was a message of love and forgiveness, and it was very simple. It wasn't complicated. And through the centuries, you can look at all the great cathedrals built all over Europe and all over the world, uh, and all the dogma and all the, the great, if you call them great, books, you know, were removing this man, this man who, who many think of, you know, like an avatar, great leader. Increasingly, his message became diluted around all the trappings of the church and all the books and scriptures. So Ernest Holmes had a simple message, and he loved his teaching. And again, the conflict, if there was a conflict, was how it, how it could go forward. 
And it's gone forward, and the two, or, well, there are several organizations, three or four. We were initially a very independent group, and we were part of a group of in, independent groups. And um, New Thought went on. It went on with lots of places. Mary Baker Eddy was another one. She understood the, the healing power that we understand that's possible from this teaching. But her approach was, what I'll say, more closed in that she believed in the ability of healing through faith, okay? And her followers wouldn't so much be believers in modern medicine or uh, antibiotics or uh, some of the wonders that we understand um, today, which uh, we would embrace. Um, there was a book, The Quantum Doctor, years ago, which uh, Amit Goswami, who was the author, he said, there's much that can be learned from Eastern healing. They're ahead of us in so many ways. But modern medicine, Western medicine, you know, through the use of antibiotics, various vac vaccines, and Western surgery is, is a miracle too. So in our, in our uh, version of New Thought, we find this divine activity in everything, including medicine. So we're open, we're open to learn, we're open to learning new ways, because the thing we know is life is always moving forward. So when we're talking today about uh, the subject of challenges or problems, Raymond Charles Barker is very emphatic when he says, problems have answers, problems have solutions. So we're in new thought, and as I said before, there's a lot of us now in new thought. New thought has been absorbed into many different organizations now. Uh, the, the centers of the future we absolutely now understand are going to be hybrid organizations. So that's just the reality. Funny enough, we've been, we were studying that in our integral growth model here way back in 2017. We understood that the church of the future, if you can, if you all, you've heard of the Jimmy Fallon show before, my generation would be Johnny Carson, right? There'd always be people in the audience, right? But what was the bigger audience with Johnny Carson or Jimmy Fallon? It was, it was the broadcast audience. And, you know, I know I have had older, I shouldn't say older, but people who are from a different generation, they always looking for, their spiritual centers to be like they used to be. Well, I'm here to say that's never, <laughs> it's never going to be that way. Uh, life goes forward. It was Caleb Gibran who says, um, um, you know, I, he said many things on the subject, but the one thing you can't do about life is you can't put it back. You can only understand that it, it unfolds and it's longing for itself and it's looking for different forms of expression. Uh, the spiritual centers of the future will not look like this one. And we've changed a lot. If you look at our studio here, we have camera people and set up and people in the audience and we have a lot of people outside. Well, there will be more of that, not less. The podiums probably will disappear and there'll be groups and there'll be people talking about these very healing principles in a different way. And to that end, we're currently open and looking for uh, some people of different um, cultures to come in. I've been in talk with uh, ministers of uh, similar uh, New Thought um, uh, denominations that can come in and share as we develop our spiritual center here in New York. Uh, we've had several conversations this week. And so it's exciting times, but the thing is we need to be open to it because if we keep on being stiff and doing things in a certain way, uh, we're destined to be like the, the, uh, the, the churches all over, you know, the, the world that have cl closed. Uh, it was James Campbell who said, you know, our job here is to keep pointing people to the mystery. Okay, keep pointing people to the power and keep reminding them that they have it and how to use it. So we want to embrace change we look forward to change we we've changed like crazy through covid and uh we're learning and we're growing we who are in this collective are probably uh barker said the greatest problem solving 
uh, group of people in the world because we're using consciousness as our guide, okay? We're working with a law. We're working with a principle that's always responding to us. So you know what that means. You hear me say it almost every week. This God is within you, right? And it responds to you. It doesn't really have any choice. <laughs> you know, your life is reflected. Uh, it's, ref it's mirrored. Your consciousness, the tendency of your thoughts, you know, are announced in the world. They show up all over the place. Uh, most of all, and most of us in this teaching believe and have proven to ourselves that problems can be solved if the individual handles them from the level of consciousness. Meaning, if you rise above the bickering, and if you rise above the need to be right in an argument, and all of that, if you rise above the anger, if you let yourself come to a higher place, where you really see the good in people, and you realize you don't have any enemies, and you refuse to be offended, um, and from the four agreements, you don't take anything personally, if you do all that, you have nobody to fight with. You're going to realize everybody's doing the best they can with what they got. <laughs> and so you're willing then to lay down arms and think, okay, um, I am one with the one. I'm part of this divine action, as Parker would say. And people are doing the best they can. And if you can center yourselves in that kind of reality, you're not going to be to tossed around. Uh, you're not going to be living at the effect of the economy or the high prices or what's on the news or what people are saying about you or who's saying anything about you. or You're not going to be talking about what people have done. If you're mentally in that kind of rat race where all the stuff you're doing is just reacting to everybody all the time, uh, and if you're preoccupied with what's wrong and who's wrong and if you can even think about trying to get even or getting back and talk about what's missing well if you're doing all that you're letting yourself get tossed around and all turned up and then the peace of god eludes you <laughs> we've taught in other classes the peace of god is your one goal so you can have this calm you can have this inner sense of peace and you can use this power but there's something that you have to do also you have to find a way to calm yourself down to take this pause to know all is well and breathe in this goodness, this life, this truth, this God, and know that it's here. Otherwise, you're going to be getting messed up with everything, reacting to everything that's been said or done. And, you know, it happens. We see it happen. It happens to me sometimes. In this talk, Dr. Barker says he gets so busy, he's running a church. Running a church is really, people think you're just preparing talks like we do three times a week here. But when you're not preparing talks, there's many hours of all kinds of challenging things to deal with. So it's very easy to lose your power or to get caught up in messy situations. And then, you know, the merry-go-round merry of denial seems to creep in there. And what do I mean by that? That's an expression that came from a 12-step program. Meaning, you're part of this life that you're participating in. And sometimes you don't think that you are. Sometimes you like to think it's so-and-so who's causing the problem. And so-and-so could be anybody. <laughs> uh, we oftentimes really don't think it has anything to do with who. Yeah, because it's easier to look out. And it's the society, it's the whoever the president is, it's the politics. I mean, we can blame everything and everyone. And then... That's what I mean by the merry-go-round of denial. Without thinking, we have, we're, without thinking we have any part of it. And so we teach you we're each 100% responsible of our, for our lives and what our thinking is. And the thing is, if we are, then, and if you're in this teaching for real, and if you find yourself going negative all the time, and you're focused on negativity, who's doing things wrong, and if that's where your focus is, that's what you're creating. Uh, and then we want to pretend, well, this doesn't have anything to do with me. <laughs> This is what they're doing. Everything has everything to do with you. And everything has, everything, has, everything has everything to do with me. Because we're all in this together. We're creating this world together. Uh, and, you know, oftentimes we're giving our power away because we're reacting, reacting, reacting. Um, 
Years ago, I, some, I thought about, you know, I pick up the phone. I was in business, which meant I had to pick up the phone all the time. I couldn't just not answer the phone. And there was, I was a choice always whether I would be getting angry or reacting or whether I could be taking that pause and just slowing down and just realize I could see peace instead of this and I don't have to give my power away. Our human tendency is always to go to the world of form and to talk about people, places, and things, and what's wrong and what's missing. Uh, and certainly that is the way most of the world operates. You know, you just it's the world of effects. The thing about it, I want you to try and understand today is you are the cause to your own world. So you can go out of this room today, this center in, in New York City, and you can create New York City to be whatever you want it to be today. I mean, you could be going down the street and you can be seeing good in God in everything and everyone. Uh, this is what you can do. You have the power. But the, it's the way of the world. It's much more difficult to take what is called the road less traveled, which is to live in the world from a spiritual van, vantage point, to think for yourself. That's a gift that I learned mostly from Ralph Waldo Emerson. To think for yourself, to learn how to act intelligently and not to react to everything. People ask themselves, well, what can I do? What can I do with all these things? Well, you know, one thing is you can think about your thinking and watch your reactions. My negative thinking, my involvement with other people who are also negative. You know, if you're hanging out with a bunch of people who are talking garbage, that's not a nice way to say it. But if you're hanging out with a bunch of people that are always doing ain't it awful and poor me and who's wrong and all fired up with, you know, all of that, what can you do? What can you do about that? You know what you can do. <laughs> you don't hang out with them so much. Or you don't hang out with them uh, at all. You practice some Alan Arcota principles, which are boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. You might say, I can't escape my own family. Okay, but that doesn't mean you have to hang out um, in those conversations all day and all night. You have the power to change that channel within your own mind. I have the power to watch TED Talks. I have the power to go on YouTube and listen to Ernest Holmes. I have the power to listen to Wayne Dyer, Deepak Chopra. I have the power to listen to anything that we've done before on Facebook. On all of our things are on Facebook and the website. There's lots of places you can put your attention. So, what can I do about all the problems? What's there for me to realize? What's there for me to know are the better questions for a practitioner of uh, this teaching. What's there for me to understand? Those are better questions. What's here for me, right? Um, what, what can I believe? And, and that's where everything starts, Dr. Barker said. We want to look at some of our beliefs because the, our beliefs, we'll call that the core stuff, that stuff gets reflected in your world. If I keep on believing life is terrible, what do you think I'm going to experience? If I keep on thinking there's, this world is terrible and you know, life is going to hell and there's bad people and the other part of the world is trying to kill us, and we're, you know, we have all that inner stuff going on. Lately, everybody's talking about, well, I won't name the country, so I'm, I won't even speak it. But the thing is, you watch what's on TV and everybody, there's always this discussion of somebody's trying to overpower um, somebody else, be they country, countries or international politics. And you can get so caught up in all of that when you're part of that same group discussion and you really don't have to be. You know, most of us are here, the older folks, you know, half well through your lives or maybe two thirds or whatever it might be. And the thing is, you have a choice. You know, life's not a dress rehearsal. Where do you want to put your personal time and attention? I mean, I get it. You can talk about all that stuff and you get yourself all whipped up. Um, recently, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine and the lady is, I don't know, we'll say 80-ish. And all, you get all anger, angry about it all kinds of things and and I'm saying why do you want to do that I mean you know honestly truly you know uh, you have um, your prosperity um, there's places you can go there's people you can be speaking with there's such there's so much here to be enjoyed right you know Louise Hay used to have the switch thought she'll look at yellow roses 
I mean, you can look at so many beautiful things. You can be in nature, you can reflect on children, you can, you know. Why the heck would anybody want to keep on focusing on the problems? Because if you keep focusing on the problems and who's right and who's wrong and what's missing, you've got to understand if that's your point of view, if that's your focus, if this is what you're determined to see, it will multiply. You'll see more of it. Um, the earlier teachers of our philosophy used to say, we do our work in mind. Now, that's a phrase that Reverend Judith and I kind of like grew up on, I'm sure. But that isn't, what, that isn't really the way we say it anymore, I'll say it in another generation. We do our work in consciousness. And what they're saying is we do our work in consciousness and it isn't really about doing anything physically. Uh, it isn't about, it's about lifting yourself to a different place. You know, you heard the song before, from a distance you can see harmony. You know, if you look at your own life and you look backwards, if you've been around a while, you can look through your teens and your 20s and now your 30s and my 40s and 50s, you can see that you've really moved through so much, you have grown so much. And it's your, if you reflect back a little bit, not that we're big believers in looking backward, but if you do, you can see, my goodness, all these tough, tough times and situations and people and relationships have brought you to a place of such wisdom and such knowing. And you can honestly see, if you want to say the hand of God in it, you can see, my God, everything that happened really brought me to a much higher place. Uh, you've grown a lot and you can understand and discern that, you know, there's something in life that's kept you moving forward and you've grown and you will continue to grow because that's what life does. So in this teaching, there's nothing to do materially. There's only something to know spiritually. And I'll say that to you again. There's not anything that you have to do. We do our work in consciousness. There's only something to know spiritually. And when you start to approach things spiritually, and also with the heart of, and mind of forgiveness and love, you're going to find every kind of solution in the world. You'll often hear me say, because I borrowed it well, <laughs> elsewhere, all my material that's so wonderful, by the way, has been borrowed. And I can't take credit for anything. But you'll always hear me say, I could see peace instead of this. Wherever there is what we'll call the mess, and there's always going to be that, you have the ability because you're the decider. You're the person who has executive power that Ernest Holmes talks about. You can see peace instead of this. When people are talking about rising prices and the, the, the civilization going to hell and all the things that people talk about, that doesn't have to be your reality. Bill Tolliver years ago in Fort Lauderdale when the world was going through a, a recession, you know, somewhat worse even than what you, know, you hear in the news now, uh, Dr. Bill put on that huge mar marquee out there, we heard there's a recession, and he put in huge print, we're not participating. And I thought, my goodness God, you know, he was really something else. Because he thought, you know, life isn't about recession, life is not about that, life is about expansion. And there's no limits on anybody in this room, there's no limits on anyone that's uh, on this call. You yourself are a unique expression of God life and the sky is the limit for you. So please stop buying into that kind of messaging. Turn off those channels, read a book, go to YouTube if you don't like to read, <laughs> put on your you know, iPods, listen to Louise Hay. You can listen to me all 24 hours a day. I don't know why you'd want to, but all those lessons, <laughs> they're there. And they serve as reminders. Because what we're here to do always is to keep reminding you of how great you are. And that's what we do. So if you want to have success, you start thinking of these spiritual ideas. I could see peace instead of this. Resist the temptation to go there. Go there means resist the temptation to get involved in the blame game. And who, well, who's wrong and what they've done. And, because wherever you're pointing those fingers, honest to God, that they more often speak to your un own unhealed uh, aspects of yourself because all of us have things that we need to work on. Uh, when things are revealed to you spiritually, you can start from that realization that, that all is well. That was 
you know, what Louise Hay always said, in spite of everything, you can keep saying to yourself, all is well, because you know that, you know, you're in the perfect place, perfect time, and, and you know that this spirit, which is within you, is moving forward, and wherever you are, is you're there by divine right, and first of all, you're not there permanently, you're always, you are always an activity in the mind of God, so we want to come from that connect, connected place. And when you know that you have that connection, that power, uh, that kind of knowing, that's spiritual knowledge. And when you're in that place of knowing, you're able to realize and believe every problem has a solution, which is today's talk title. Now, it may not be the way your intellectual mind has worked things out. Our intellects are always involved in analysis and we're dealing with form, you know, all the inbound stuff. And we're looking out at a world that seems to be full of limitations. It looks like, you know, there's not enough clean air, there's not enough clean water, there's not enough clean food, there's not enough food. You look at the world from that vantage point, you're seeing all the problems. So the world out there speaks of problems. The world within speaks to solutions if you go there. Luckily, Dr. Barker said there's been great thinkers throughout the ages. And thinkers who didn't accept the doom and gloom. Uh, they, weren't, they were people who just wouldn't, they knew there had to be another way. They stepped away from what we'll call the collective consciousness and they knew that life is always moving forward. So to the extent that you can be one of these people on the leading edge, to the extent you can step out of the reactive world, the action and reaction, and understand that life is always moving forward. You can get excited about your own life, whether you're eight or you're 80. Um, so it's intelligent, it's very intelligent to step aside from all of that because life is attempting to evolve through each and every one of us. Spirit really tries to get your attention. It really tries to, through your dreams, through your quiet moments, through your divine discontent, there is that which is within you that understands and connects. And you really almost have to work hard to silence it because it's always there. I know those of us who are in recovery programs, many of us turn to, I don't know, alcohol, drugs, every type of food. You know, we've turned to all kinds of things because we just, we want to silence our feelings and deal with our feelings and medicate our feelings. But the thing is, this thing that is inside of you really wants you to expand and grow and, and listen to it and pause and be instructed. Uh, because life is all about lessons and they keep coming. I used to not like it when I was younger when I heard the dice of God are always loaded. But now I understand <laughs> it means the lessons are keeping coming and you can get them. And if you don't get them, and if you refuse to get them, the only thing about it is they keep coming anyway. We have an old expression, same song, different verse, a little bit louder, a little bit worse. All that really is saying, sounds scary, is get the lesson. I'd rather get the nudge, right, the cosmic nudge, than get what we call the cosmic two by four. Because the lesson's gonna keep coming. And it's not there to hurt you, it's there to help you grow. Every great spiritual leader has really not followed the way of the world. <laughs> Each of them in their own way have been helping humanity step up, helping humanity evolve. Uh, there have been many in our own lifetime. You can think of some of them, um, Martin Luther King, uh, John Kennedy, um, many of the people you know, who have been architects for change, and you can look to all of the religions where people at great sacrifice uh, they stepped out of religious traditions because they moved into science. You, know, you can't believe that the world is flat anymore, for example. You can't be, you know, we understand that there's this creative um, intelligence that keeps moving through everyone. So these people, philosophers, um, activists, uh, uh, people who are mystics, uh, people of, uh, of great understanding, brave men and women from every culture on the every planet. They've always, uh, people have tried to hold them back. <laughs> uh, 
you know, orthodoxy, churches, organizations, it happens even in new thought. You know, we teach that there's a power within you that's irrepressible, and it wants you to express yourself, and it isn't to be bound. Um, and if we come to understand what these people have uh, taught us from before, all of our lives would be different. Emerson always loved because he said, God help us when a thinker is let loose upon a planet. I mean, a real thinker. <laughs> He'll say, nothing is safe, meaning, you know, the, life, the world changes when people wake up and they realize, you know, I'm more than this. I can think for myself. Um, when you come into religious science, we're never going to tell you what to think. But we're going to tell you there is that which is within you that knows. And if Theo were here, Reverend Theo, and she would say, and it shows. It's in you, it knows, and it will show. And these great leaders, if they had not done what they have they've done throughout history, uh, they would have never lifted humanity uh, and brought us to the place where we are. These great minds down through the ages uh, sensed that having new ideas was the answer. And you want to solve your own problems today? I guess I could do this whole thing in a shorter form. Having new ideas. Stepping out of, well, they used to do this when? And, you know, and everything was like that. Well, here's the thing. We're not in the 1980s or 90s anymore. Okay? This is the 2020s. And everything is changing, and the thing is, we're capable of changing. We're capable of having new ideas. This center, somehow through COVID, has done amazing things. We renovated a building. We uh, saved a lot of expenses uh, by moving the pastor's uh, residence to the third floor. Uh, we bought a building that was full of every code violation known to mankind, and we fixed everything. And, you know, we've developed a hybrid... Um, Center and our messaging is one of the largest messaging in the country right now. And how did that happen? And it didn't happen overnight. It, it happened because everybody knew that it had to happen. We understood the centers before. You know, we were, uh, we were at Lincoln Center, and that wasn't working. We didn't have time for community time. And we moved to Subud, which was a great idea for growth. And, you know, then we had um, COVID come into the picture. And, you know, we're, we live in touch with what's going on and we make changes. And the thing about that is all of us are faced, to do, faced with that in our day-to-day -day living. Uh, you know, lots of things happen. All the people who are the tenants of this building, their livelihood was based upon their biz businesses in this building. And every one of them closed and they left and their livelihood changed. And we felt very sorry for them and helped try to help them. And the thing is, they're all now doing something else somewhere because they had to make, they had to pivot. They had to make other decisions. That's the type of stuff that uh, we have contended with in the center. No one has any clue on earth the amount of um, <laughs> work that's involved in all of that. And so people form a lot of opinions. And it's unfortunate, you know, when you get into judgment because you'll never know the whole story. Uh, but we're, we're challenged always with moving forward. No matter what loss there's been, whatever's happened, we're challenged to see the good and to keep moving forward. Jesus, if you can trust anything that was ever written about him, right? And we do trust some of it. Jesus said, it's done unto you according to your belief. Which was his way of saying, it's done unto you according to your ideas, the ideas you hold dear to your heart. So now you're going to say, all right, I'm in a problem. What do I do? First of all, this Barker, Raymond Barker said, calm yourself down if you find yourself in a problem. If you're spinning and reacting, get still. And so you'll say to yourself, all right, mind. <laughs> you are the spirit of life in me. You have the answer to this situation. I know and reveal it to me. Say that softly, say that quietly, say it definitely over and over again. And a little idea will begin to take shape. Spirit will always answer you, by the way. Um, if you go to bed or you say something, you know, I know that there's an answer to this. And if you believe that you have an answer, it's 
Very interesting to me. Usually the next day or within a day or two, it's something out of the blue. I have a new idea. And, and the new idea wasn't there when I'm like, in, you know, if you're in a place where you're frustrated and you just don't know. This is how life works. It will always reveal to you a different way, a better way. And you'll welcome it when, you, when it comes up for you by saying, wait a minute, uh, I, I, this is something new. I didn't think of it this way before. And it might look like a hunch or knowing or it just comes out of the blue. An idea comes and that idea will grow. And after a while, you're going to know. You're going to know that you know that it's right. And you're go, then you'll start to follow through on the idea. You can do all that if you're not in reaction. If you're hot and you're angry and you're saying things coming out of your mouth over the Zoom call or wherever you do, all that hot-headed type of reactive stuff, you know, people do it. I've done it before myself. It's not terribly enlightened. Um, but follow those hunches, those inner knowings. And as you learn to do that more and more, where you learn, learn to act purposely, intelligently, and from a connected place, uh, everything starts to shift uh, because you're in the right idea. You'll sense it. You'll feel it. Uh, you'll feel it through the people. You'll feel it through the, the act, activity you see. Uh, you'll hear it. You'll sense it uh, through the things that people are saying to you. And you do this as you live in closer contact, contact with this indwelling spirit. Uh, and, and as you're doing this, you're learning to do what Ernest Holmes talked about. You're learning to live the affirmative plight life. When something's coming up or there's an issue in, in your life, it could be a health issue, which some of us have been through. I know I have been in the past couple years. Scary stuff. When things come up that you need to deal with, you are in tune with your own body and you will know. I could give you so many examples of that where people have told me, oh, Greg, you've got this terrible thing. And I was led to one person to another person and things were dealt with that they look really scary, but you know, if you're living in tune with life, you'll be led to the right people and the right solutions. They'll always be there. Dr. Bar Barker was always talking about hospitals for <laughs> some reason. He didn't like them. And he said adamantly, I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't want to talk about hospitals, um, and so on and so forth. But then he admitted, in the end, I will go to one of them <laughs> because I believe in the wisdom of the medicine. I believe in the wisdom of the doctors. I believe in the person that I trust who referred me. So um, even though he didn't particularly like hospitals, he said, I wouldn't sit back and avoid going though. <laughs> he said, but what I'd be working on, guess what, is my affirmative prayers because I know that's where the real power is. We build up in our, see when you're working with consciousness and you learn how to do affirmative prayer and it, please, you don't have to just learn our way of doing it, but it's a really effective way. It's very powerful. When we do our affirmative prayer work, we're building up our consciousness. We're doing it all the time. And he said, because of my spiritual work, uh, I'm always led to exactly the right hands, the right um, medical people, the right place, the right time, because I'm doing my spiritual work. And he says it happens all the time. And I can do my spiritual work in every single area of my life. I can do it with my relationships. I can do it with my job. I can do it with uh, whatever the horrible thing or you know, place I've found myself or I've been in through divorces, I've been through pain, and I've had issues with children. I can do something about it. There, is, there are answers to these situations if we do our spiritual work. Dr. Barker was telling a story he was always caught up in raising enough money to keep this church going. <laughs> so he said, for three days I was losing money at the church because he opened up the checks. He loved finding what he called happy money. And for three days he was opening up the mail and there wasn't any happy money coming in. And then he started nurturing a story that the church was losing money. And then he realized, oh my God, I'm nurturing this story that the church is losing money. And he exclaimed, the flow of money in my world stopped. <laughs> so Wednesday night when I got home, he said, I sat myself down and I said, Raymond, wait a minute. This is absolutely ridiculous to keep thinking this way. And he said, I got very quiet. Wait a minute, stop, stop, stop this negative stuff. 
He said, the mind in me, and the mind in that church has always prospered, and it's prospering me now. And I accept that any and all things in my subconscious mind that have cut it off are now erased, nullified, and they are gone. See, he wasn't blaming the church or the people who were collect. You know, he was saying, I'm going to search out those patterns in me, <laughs> and they're going to be nullified and gone. He's going to cancel, cancel them. And he said, I did that for about 10 minutes, and I did it in the morning, and when I got to the office the next day, he said, he opened the mail, and lo and behold, there was the flow of money coming again. Uh, he said, something in me had cut it off. And he said, something in me opened the channel and the people involved in sending uh, in the contributions didn't even know it. And he laughed. He said, but I knew that I cr created it and I also knew how to clear it. Now this is why I say all problems have a spiritual solution. All questions have an answer. It, it says, uh, it's prof this statement is profound and it is as simple as that. You and I do not often get quiet enough because we live in such a noisy world. I mean, we have our headsets on. We live with our devices. We're, think how much time you spend with your iPhones and your, your devices and your tablets and your computers and your streaming. We live in a... <laughs> and then, you know, we live... You know, we're not living in the country here, by the way. <laughs> Some of you watching are. So we're really living in a busy, busy world. Uh, so we're busy looking for answers, and we're looking for answers oftentimes in all the right, wrong places. We try to do everything, we go here, we go there, we're asking everyone for answers, and everybody will tell you what to do, because everybody knows exactly what you should do, said Barker. All your life, all kinds of people would tell you what to do if you'd let them. And Barker said, I've stopped asking people what to do. I have stopped. I don't ask any people, you know, he will ask for help, of course, if he needed it. But he said, I've stopped asking people what to do. He said, and he smiled because he said, they will tell me. Uh, he said, we want to get smarter. Nobody really knows what's right for you. And in this teaching, you learn that. You see, there is that which is within all of us. That it's connected with source. And if you learn to nurture and develop that relationship, the answers come for you individually. Please don't ever let the preacher or the minister be the person who tells you all of that. Because all we can do is encourage you and remind you of who you are and you know, really get, help you get excited about your own life and help you realize that you can demonstrate healing in every area. But what we want you to do is to inquire within because there is that part of you that always knows what to do and spirit will answer that if you begin to commune with it. Some of us are living our lives with a lot of dysfunction. Some of us are living our lives with a lot of craziness, or I'll just call it confusion. My, my confusion, and you know, if I have this confusion, I, if I'm addicted to being right, you know, really what that means is I'm not open to hearing new answers. I keep repeating all the old grievances who's done me wrong and who's, you know, if I keep all that going and I'm living in confusion and I have all these screwed up relationships in my family and my friends and with my exes and all of that, some people really don't want um, clarity. They're just caught up in that and, and, you know, I can't judge it. But Barker was saying, Dr. Barker, if you slow down and you get quiet, the answers are always going to come. Um, and do you have to go on a long retreat or meditate or, I joked a few weeks ago, do a novena like they used to with my family. You don't have to do any of that stuff. <laughs> you don't have to take these retreats. You don't have to meditate for days or chant. Do I need to shut out the world for some long period of time? And it, Dr. Barker says, no, you don't have to do any of that. He says, a few minutes every single day can do great things. Possibly a few minutes in the morning to bring your consciousness back to a place of knowing you are a spiritual activity in the mind of God. A few moments of meditation for you to remind yourself of who you are. I'm one with the one. And this is where the ideas will flow when you bring yourself and you take that pause. This is where the solutions will be found. 
So I bring my mind back. My mind's been so busy in my business. You know, I've been glued to CNN and CNBC and Fox and everybody. And, and, and I'm developing this whole consciousness that the sky is falling, this said Chicken Little, and everything's going to hell. And Now, who's doing that to you? Nobody except you. You have the ability to choose. That's the, one of the great lessons of science of mind. You are the selector. You get to choose what you view, who you talk to, what conversations you entertain. Dr. Barker stated that running first church was very much like running a business. There's always quick decisions that need to be made that people will never realize, and I can say that right here because you have no clue. <laughs> it's been a lot, especially the past few years. And he said, sometimes he's so busy he can't see straight. And I can relate to that also. And I can tell you that's absolutely true if you're trying to grow any type of enterprise. And he was always trying to grow First Church. He said his mind is busy. And I'm thinking that's probably true for most people on the broadcast. All of you are busy. You have busy, busy lives. Some of you are working two jobs. You're taking care of grandchildren. You're taking care of people who are ill. Um, some of you are teachers. Some of you are grandparents, counselors. And some of you are dealing, I know very well, with some very, very, I won't say serious, but you're dealing with health challenges. Others right now have been displaced and you're dealing with financial issues. And everybody seems to be managing so much. And I knew that, I know that's true at the center too. Somehow we have been you know, operating, we lost the church rental income. And, you know, we've been surviving on the gifts that you guys send and, and the investments that we still have. And it's been a lot of work with a lot of people. And, you know, and because we are able to be a hybrid community now, we're starting to get uh, supported from people all over the country. So that's really, it's God in action. If, if in our own lives, though, with all these things that we manage, if you want to be effective at anything, if you want to solve whatever challenges are in your life, the first thing to do is to get centered, to take a pause, the pause that we talk about all the time, a pause that refreshes and restores. I would suggest, like Dr. Barker, to do this at least a couple times a day. 1980, when I got myself involved in a 12-step program, they told me, like, do this like every hour on the hour. Take five minutes, because I was always reacting when I was younger, reacting to everything and all the time. And furthermore, everything would be your fault in my mind. I mean, that's how I would say twisted. It's just like, you know, don't judge yourself for being there if you're there. It's just somehow you have to reel that back <laughs> and say, I can see peace instead of this. You know, all is well. Calm yourself down. Just keep gently. Don't do it with criticism, because that will work the opposite way. Never, never, never criticize yourself, but calm yourself down and realize that the real motivation of life is the action of ideas in your consciousness. Now, this is one of the best things he said in that talk. Realize that the real motivation in life, everything that happens in your life, is the action of ideas that you have in your consciousness. So if you think about it, it's your ideas that put everything into action in your world. That's really a great realization if you get it, and it's important. The real motivation of life is the action of the ideas that are in your consciousness right now. So we want to follow through on, on all these ideas as they pop up in our minds. And it all begins and ends with a movement of correct knowing. What you deeply know in your heart, in your mind, it's played out in your world. If Shirley were here, she'll talk about the mirror. What you deeply really know, it's reflected, just like a mirror. So Dr. Barker is saying in this phrase, clear, correct knowing uh, is not knowing the problem. Clear, correct knowing is knowing the solution. In other words, it, if there's health issues, you don't talk about everything that's on WebMD. What you do is you talk about the wellness and the health and the perfection that's here. My God, if you keep on looking up all the diagnosis and everything that could be wrong, you're going to be like creating, it will just fill your mind up with everything that could be wrong and it's just the exact opposite of what you want to do. Dr. Barker said, again, 
the phrase. Clear, correct knowing is not knowing the problem. It is knowing the solution. Focus on the health, the wholeness, the perfection that you have, the divine pattern that's here and now and within you that's operating. Any one of us can describe the problem. We can talk about what's wrong with people and what they're doing wrong and you know what's wrong with everything. Please resist the temptation to go there. Weeks ago I talked about hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. I mean, it's work because it's so easy to get drawn into all of that. Um, he said, if you go visit a sick person, he said, just listen to them. First of all, the sick person doesn't really want you to talk, usually. Usually they want an audience. And so you, good person, you're going to visit them and you hear everything they're going through. And then when you get up, after having them given them a chance to talk for a while, um, you say, I know you're going to be okay and you're going to be fine and because you, you're trying to do something nice to be supportive. And the person looks at you and says, I hope so. <laughs> and he says, you know darn well that they're not going to be all right because they don't believe they're going to be all right. Uh, it's, and he said, because they're like most people. See, most people will do that. He says, but you're not like most people. If you're really working in this teaching, you've, you have the ability and you will see things differently if you become committed to this teaching. He said, because people are going to continue with their misery, which they are unconsciously perpetuating. This is what goes on beneath the surface for most people. You know, you can come to our class on Tuesday and we speak quite a bit about our surface mind, which is all about the thoughts that we're thinking. We have all kinds of things flooding our minds throughout the day. That's our surface mind. Um, the random thoughts. This is where that whole part of us, um, all this stuff that's within us, not the surface, but the stuff that's deep within us, our beliefs, the totality of all that plays out in our day-to-day -day living. So. If you have a lot of inner tapes, inner loops that are all about negativity uh, and judgment of others and judgment of yourself and resentment, anger and all of that, you know, uh, it's going to do you great harm. So as you can, we come together on Tuesday, Thursday and Sunday, uh, we have a chance to alter all of that. Um, people are doing it all over the world. This whole inner thing that they have, it you know, comes from our past programming, what we learned when we were younger, and we keep, that keeps playing out over and over again. But what we're asking you here to do is always to step out of that past programming. Keep coming, tune in wherever you can, even if you can just watch a rebroadcast, and let yourself remind yourself to stop doing that. I joke with it, I teach it, I say stop in the name of love. Wherever you find yourself going to the negative, wherever you catch yourself, stop it and replace it with the positive idea. And before you know it, the positive ideas will start taking shape. People don't realize, you know, the great vast number of people in the world don't realize that they could stop a lot of their own misery. Uh, it, the journey is, you know, it's a journey without a distance, meaning you begin in consciousness by taking charge of your thoughts and your thinking in your surface mind, you know. Uh, Thursday night, I always ask that question, what's it been like being you? It's really because I want you to pay attention to what your conversation's been, because that thing is the thing that you're putting into your subconscious. Uh, and you don't want your subconscious continually to be harnessing those negatives. Correcting all of that erroneous thinking that Wayne Dyer spoke about. You know, that's how we begin, one day at a time. Uh, as you begin to do this and pay attention to the words you express, and start using words that are kinder and less judgmental, you'll begin internalizing more positive thinking. And your inner world will begin to shift. So your tendency of thought starts getting more positive and lighter, and then miraculously people show up smarter and kinder and more wonderful. They probably always have been that way, but you wouldn't have seen them <laughs> that way. Because if it's living within you, the brokenness and the disconnect, then that's what you see, that's how you see life. Your outer world will mirror that which lives within. Here's a warning. Don't, this is from Raymond Charles Barker, directly to every one of you today. Don't try to change your friends. Don't try to change others. 
You could also learn that from an alumni meeting, if you ever went to one. <laughs> you know, work on yourself. Don't try to change them. People are where they are by divine right. Now, you might not like, like where they are, but their life is unfolding in divine order, just as yours has, just as mine has. Um, I had a grandmother who I loved to death, but she was a perpetual worrier. That's all she ever did was worry, I swear to God. I, I, I wouldn't think that she enjoyed it, but there had to be some benefit that she was getting from it. And I thought about it last night. Most likely she got a lot of attention from everybody, as I think back, uh, because she was worrying about everybody. My mother, my father, my brothers and sisters, everybody. Um, we have to find a way to detach from all that. You can still love people, but you cannot afford to get involved with all that level, what we'll call it, confusion, or what some of you call the mess. When you get sucked into all that downward negativity and thinking, you, know, it's, you have to find a way to stop it. And you're not here to blame them or make them wrong. It's not about feeling superior. It's simply about the realization that you have one life. You're living your own glorious life right now. And if you get yanked around into all this stuff with everything everybody is doing. Um, you know, the joy, the beauty, and all the goodness that you could be experiencing, uh, it will elude you because you're all, you're in that whole world. As soon as you find yourself drawn into something like that, you can release the need for that. Dr. Barker said, your people as they see you change might think that you've become cold or heartless and and all of that, but you're really growing up. You're being a little bit like Jesus when he said, I need to be about what? My, my father's business, right? Um, Dr. Barker said, I'm not heartless at all. Honest to God, I know my teaching. You cannot change another living soul unless they want to be changed. And that's really an important lesson. There was an old saying from 12-step programs that I heard 40 years ago, which was, let the hand of the 12-step program be there when someone reaches out for help. It isn't let, you know, we're going to go fix them. We don't go fix people. You know, we, we're there for people, our center. We, we're here when people are reaching out for help. It's important when someone's reaching out legitimately for help. Then it's appropriate to try to help your brother, your sister. Love them as you love you. Uh, and it, this comes from, I believe, Jesus also. Until the sick really want to get well, they're going to stay sick. And that is the law. Until the unhappy want to get well, they're going to stay unhappy. Until the poor want to get prosperous, they're going to stay poor. We teach this whole thing is about consciousness. If anyone wants to get better in any situation, truly, the universe is always going to support them. It doesn't just support Greg or Judith or any of us. The universe supports everybody equally. So if anyone wants to improve and wants to ascend and get better in any kind of situation. The universe has everyone's back. Reverend Barker said that they better change their conversations if they want to achieve great things. Now that reminds you of who every Thursday night. Elevating that conversation is what we encourage people to do. You see, I've talked to people, he said, he was counseling all the time. People talked about their money problems. He says they'll talk for 20 minutes about what they don't have. And then he says, I want them to talk to me for about two minutes about what they do have. And they look at him like he had three heads. You know, he said, hey, listen, I've listened to you talk for 20 minutes about what you don't have. Let's talk for two minutes about what you do have. Let's talk about some solutions. Uh, and the answers he would get back, I don't know that there's a solution. And, and he said, well, that's the reason you don't have one. <laughs> you're not going to have a solution if you don't start talking about solutions. If you keep on talking about what you don't have, you're kind of like locked in this vicious circle. He tried it another way. He said, if you can't talk about your money, he says, let's take out a $5 bill and look at it. Look at the front of it. Look at the back of it. Look at the wonderful design. Somebody designed this magnificent bill. Look at the beautiful engravings. Look at the way it's done. Look at all the thought that was involved in it, the design. And they just sit back and they don't know what I'm talking about because they're so sure that they're just not going to have enough and they're caught, about what, they're caught up in, about their rent or the loan that they're, uh, uh, what their creditors are going to do. He says, 
Uh, these are examples of the power of the spoken word. If that person I'm counseling just doesn't believe I have word I'm saying and they're focused on what they don't have, he said, I might be a great counselor, but nothing's going to change. You know, these people need to be open and receptive and learn, you know. And so he was trying to give them great suggestions, but oftentimes people, uh, you know, they're kind of like stuck. Uh, he suggested for us to read what the great minds have said or written. And today, for the younger generation, I say, go to YouTube, because mo most of it you can watch. You, a lot of it you can find on, on, in, today in, you know, without reading the books. But commune with these great minds, and, or read what they've written, and find what you'll find is affirmative, creative, inspirational, up, up, uplifting ideas. You'll find great ideas, because these people that we're talking about knew uh, the great minds uh, that are living on this planet know. They knew and they know that there is no problem that cannot be solved. So I want you to walk away today with that. There is no challenge, there is no problem that cannot be solved. There are only people who won't solve them. The problems can be solved, but there are people who will not solve them because they're so caught up to, in their old stories. A quote from Frederick Bales, who's one of the main authors of our Tuesday class, there are no incurable diseases. There are only incurable people. So let's extend this a little bit. There's no problems that cannot be solved. There are only people who won't bother to solve them. People who prefer to sit and stew and have some kind of version of poor me and oh, isn't this terrible? Uh, this, of course, is a choice. Um, some people go on and they think every, everything's unfair and all of life is against me and they've got a perpetual chip on their shoulder. And if you keep saying that and believing that, then you're not going to go for the opportunity. Yeah, okay, lots of things have happened to people. I've been through a lot of hell in my life. Everybody's gone through versions of things, right? And if you keep on coming from the place where you've lost um, and you keep on nurturing the idea that everyone's against me, and my whole life experience and my whole family experience. If you keep doing this stream of negativity, um, unless, until the time where you step out of it and say, look, I'm a victim no more, I'm not doing this anymore. Until these people step out of those limiting patterns of thought and step up and change into creative me a creative mental attitude, there's nothing much more anybody can do for them. And I'm sorry to say many of these people are familiar with all the things we teach. And many people like today are listening to us on uh, Facebook and YouTube, and many will comment, it's beautiful what you say, Dr. Greg, I'm so uplifted, I'm so inspired. But it requires more than that. It requires much more than a passive listening. It requires something more. The purpose of religious science is to see something in a new and better way and to do something creative about it. Look at it and say, wait a minute, uh, do you have more power than my mind has? Does this disorder or this confusion or this difficulty have more power than my mind? And the answer is always, of course, no. So whatever the problem is, does it have more power than your own individual mind? No. But we hand our power over and we say, um, I'm, I'm going to give you my full attention. Uh, I, gi I give you all my attention, of course, and then the problem just eats it up. Problems love attention. Um, so I'm being told that I'm going too long with the talk, so let me wrap this up a little bit further. Sometimes our mind and our intellect work against us and cause confusion. Sometimes I say to my intellect, this is Barker, oh, shut up, Pop, just stop. Dr. Barker would claim that he would be laughing with himself as he was talking to himself. He says, I release the need of, for all of this negative chatter. He said, I'm glad I live alone, otherwise they would put me away. And eventually he stated he would have to shut the intellect up. And he said, I'd calm myself up and say, I have the divine answer. I want the divine answer. I want an answer now, I'm receptive to it, and it will take place in my mind right now. And it happens. And it will happen for you. Um, Many of us want the world around us to solve our problems and, and won't happen that way. 
People are looking for Social Security, Medicare, and every kind of uh, guarantee. Uh, the problems keep going on, uh, he said, because the problems are self-caused. Um, we need to learn to put a demand on consciousness and know that all is well. Uh, I think I'll continue on with this lesson and a part two at a later date. Uh, so the answer to every problem uh, will come from a spiritual idea, okay? That you are enough, you have enough, that you are one with the one. Everything you could possibly need, you have. It's there in consciousness. The kingdom, if you want to call it a kingdom, the realm of good is here. It always has been. We, though, are a little bit like horses with blinders on, meaning we see what we see, but we don't see all around us that everything is already here. Uh, what would Reverend Theo say? All the good that you need, I have provided. What else did she say? Everything you need for life and godliness is available to you right now. Right now. Okay. 